close to this one. and the traditional owners of the land from which people are zooming in on tonight. I will send my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that we are on the unceded land. There's a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. People here in person tonight, if you need to use the bathroom, just parade yourself in front of everyone and have a good stage. That's about, about uh, three meters away, just head to towards the lights. If you can bear the, the stairs now that you can use the internal lights as well. Uh, there is a bar, it looks like most of you have found it. It will reopen again after the event is about eight tonight. Uh, if you can switch your phones to silent, uh, of course, you're welcome to take photos and tweet, etc. If you want to do that, we are at Adelina for what I want. There will be a QA at the end, so if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to, to save them for that. Uh, to help our people on Zoom, since the questions aren't always heard very well with the audience, um, we can ask the, the chair or the chair to repeat the questions before asking them. There will also be a signing after the event, and uh, books will be available for purchase at the transfer. If you're uh, coming in online from Zoom, the Zoom audience can also ask questions using the chat box. In that same chat box, we're also posting a, a link where you can uh, purchase a copy of the book online. If you do so during this event and request it, we can also ask you to sign your copy. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the person of the hour. Woo! 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 is an Australian author and travel writer. Her work includes the Hazard River Adventure series for young readers. So it's in the Choose Your Own Ever After series. And they are high school students as the code of honor students in Brisbane. One Punch is your first adult novel. In conversation tonight is Sam Bellina. Sam studied agriculture, worked with dairy farmers, and all time to go out with her first children's book in 2008. Eight books later, her stories have been shortlisted for multiple awards. She hopes to inspire everyone to make a difference. Please make the most of it. Thank you so very much to Avid Reader for having us tonight and thank you for arriving on this chilly, chilly night. And also a lovely thank you to Jackie for making sure we keep to time and we do everything we're supposed to do. Is that right, Julie? Yes. We're going to love really to hate ourselves tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Samantha, as, as Jackie kind of introduced us, and I am so incredibly proud of the lady sitting next to me. I first met Julie many years ago. We were at a children's conference called Voices on the Coast, and it's a huge affair. I don't know how many children go, 5,000, 2,000? Oh, yeah, all over South East Queensland. And uh, they um, pair authors up, and they must have known something because they paired Julie and I up, and we got to share our accommodation, and then we got sent off to the wolves to, to, to <laughs> cope with thousands of children. And so Julie and I started off getting to know each other as children's authors, and I'm just dying to ask this question. This is not a children's book, Julie. What happened? Can you talk to us <laughs> through the process, please? Thank you, Samantha, and thank you very much for, for joining me on the stage tonight. I think after writing 11 books for kids and young adults and a play, my kids had grown up. So I no longer had little kids running around and those Hazard River adventures happening in my neighborhood. So I really actually just wanted to write a story for myself, for my peers, for my friends, for my book clubs. I have two amazing book clubs that are both here. So I wanted to write a story that I would enjoy. And actually, at first, I thought I would write a, a fun story. I, I wanted to really write a story, a Hazard River story for mums. So mums adventure on a road trip 
getting lost in the bush, a little bit like Sally's, but not quite so serious. <laughs> and do, singing karaoke and getting into lots of trouble. And I gave it a bit, that still might happen, but I gave it a bit of a shot. But this other story, One Punch, kept coming back to me. And I really saw this as a TV series. This was going to be my first TV series. <laughs> but I realised that I didn't know how to write a TV series. I did a weekend course and I still didn't know how to write a TV series. <laughs> so I thought, well, I do know how to write a book. So I decided that I would write One Punch instead of the, the Mother's Own Adventure story. writing for kids because it taught me how a plot worked that you start with a problem and the characters solve the problem and that's how you get to the end of your story and I think if you're writing commercial fiction that's a really useful skill to have very early on and sometimes it can take years to get you to to get to that stage and it's really great to know it first off so I had lots of experience writing writing a story for adults was quite different because Obviously, grade threeers are going to love you whatever you write. They just see your name on the front cover and, yes, the author's here. And I think adults are a little more discerning than that. Not always, but <laughs> they can be a bit more discerning. So, of course, it was a little bit more, I felt a little more exposed writing the story. And also with this one, I told all my friends that I was doing it because I needed their input because it's a story about mothers and I was busy sucking up everyone's stories. So I had to ask lots of people and I had to seek lots of advice from certainly from neuro, a neurosurgeon that I know who's hiding at the back there and, and other medical people, <laughs> medical people hiding at the front and also in the middle. And I got lots of expertise as well as lots of mother's stories. And I, did that answer your question? That did answer your question. Well done, Ripley. I'm very proud of your last question. So what I had wondered as an author myself was whether you had first started off thinking, you know, I might go from kids to young adults to adults. And I had wondered whether you had thought that this was going to be for young adults, but you just answered that because I think what you're saying is right from the start, you aim to have an adult audience, whatever the story was going to be, adults were going to read it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think it's, you know, maybe it's laziness on my part that it's a lot easier to write a story in the voice of a mother than in the voice of an 18-year-old boy. So, yeah, I definitely set out to write a story about mothers, for mothers and fathers. Fathers also will enjoy this book and kids will enjoy it. Perhaps anyone would. <laughs> <laughs> and if you buy three, <laughs> it says the same. So, well, I'm lucky enough to have read Julie's amazing book, and that's part of the reason I'm so incredibly proud of her because I was pinching myself the whole way through going, oh, Julie, you nailed it. In fact, I'm inspired to just leave here straight away and start writing my first adult story. But instead of doing that, I think we need to hear what the book is actually about. So some of you may know from Book Bub or for whatever reason, but for those of you who don't know, let's ask Julie just to give us a quick summary of the book. Okay. This, the premise is really simple. A 17-year-old boy is fighting for his life after a coward punch. His mother wants revenge, and the perpetrator's mother will do anything to keep her son from jail. Oh, she's practised it. <laughs> 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 that is perfect and so what I wondered was when I told people that I'm coming here tonight to help them this is how fabulous the title is one touch says so much doesn't it in just two words so with such an evocative experience we were, I was wondering whether you knew someone or whether something in the news caught your eye why this topic Julie? It's something that I've been thinking about and has been on my mind, I guess, since Oliver, my older son, finished school in 2016. So he finished school, started uni, and at the beginning of that year, there was a very, very tragic case of a boy, Oliver's age, who was king hit, coward punched, and died of his injuries the next, next day. And I think it put every parent on notice. I don't know that it put the kids on notice. They didn't seem too bothered by, you know, by the dangers that certainly parents felt. And 
but you know, I was talking to someone about it yesterday and it's like, I was, we were scared. We were scared sending, not that we were sending kids to the valley, but <laughs> having kids, having kids go to the valley, they were in a place that we thought was danger. You know, it was a dangerous situation. Boys, and you know, I'm, I'm going to speak about boys because I know boys, I have boys, and, you know, I'm not going to try and compare them to girls, but, um, you know, kids feel bulletproof. They don't see the same dangers that we do. So it was a very nerve-wracking time, waiting for boys to come home from nightclubs at 3, 4, 5 a.m., you know, waiting for the knock on you know, the door to wriggle and someone to stumble in and the Uber to to arrive. So it was very nerve wracking. Um, after that, I thought, well, at least everyone will know about this. They'll know about the danger. But every week I was still hearing stories of kids getting assaulted in the valley. So going, going out on a Saturday night and ending up in hospital. And do you like the sound effects? Thank you for the valley. Thank you for the for the And then at the at the end of the year, where you know I started to feel like things were improving in our community, um, a friend told me that her son had been punched unconscious outside a bar, and then kicked repeatedly in the face. And it just it just sickened me. I, it just left me so cold. And it hadn't happened to me or my son. So. I Imagine that happening to my friend, to Oliver's friend. And it just felt like this is a story I need to write about. I need to tell this story um, about the vulnerability of young men. You know, males are the perpetrators of violence, but they're, they're also the victims. And you know, that's that that's the story. I'm not comparing it to anybody else, any other gender or any other whatever, but it's a story that I wanted to tell. Recently, wasn't there something? Was it the Sydney show where um, a gang of boys started fighting and one of them pulled a knife? You know, so it's not king punches or, or, or something like that. It's a knife, and as mothers and parents, it's, it's terribly nerve wracking because you know they've got to get out there, but on the other hand, you want them to come home. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a it's a very it's a nerve wracking time. It's nice that my boys are at the tail end of those those no days. <laughs> no more valleys. <laughs> and I think and I think COVID has put a bit of dagger on us everything. And statistically, assaults are down in the valley. And I saw I noticed the premier was um, mentioning that assaults were down. But I thought, well, all of the nightclubs have been closed for two years, so I'm not really surprised. And then you can see it actually picking up again. And, you know, people are constantly, because I've written this book, people are reaching out and telling me about stories of their kids being assaulted in various different ways. So, yes. 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 Well, actually, I've got a few questions about the mothers, which might tell a little bit of, of you, and uh, I'd like to, to, to put some of the mothers out here on the spot a little bit to think about themselves. But before we move on to mothers, I'm really keen about the boys that you created for this story. So there's two very different boys in the story. One is the person who gets punched, and one is the perpetrator who, who does own up. Do you mind saying that? Mind saying that? <laughs> no. Doesn't own up, does own up. We do. Anyway, they're very different boys, and I can picture them both so well. In particular, Brody. He's a, a shy boy. He's introverted. He's got some um, scorpion love going on in the story. I'm wondering, did you do some research or did the boys just come to you with their particular friend this is the cone nobody's taking this out of here <laughs> who inspired those boys just well i think i stole a little bit from lots and lots of places so it wasn't anyone in particular but originally i wanted to tell a story about two very similar boys who have probably had quite similar parents and i was doing a course at the time and my tutor said I don't want to read a story about two white boys having a fight or, you know, two middle-class white boys having a fight. And so she said, you know, we need, we need to make them a little bit different from that. So I, I won't explain exactly who these two boys are, but I will say that she was talking about her, her relationship with her son and the things that her son did. And I may have stolen her son. <laughs> 
But she, the and the reason I stole her son for the story was because she said, "Well, my son couldn't go to jail for, for you know, for an assault." And I was like, "Oh." And she said, no, there's absolutely no way. He would not survive in jail. He could not survive in jail. They would not send him to jail. And I spoke to a lawyer friend who is here somewhere, I sort of sneak in. She said, if he knows right from wrong, he will go to jail if he's assaulted someone. And so but, but that kind of relationship where you just feel like there is no way my son can go to jail. And that was really the inspiration for one of the characters. You did that very, very well, actually. I, I think that we will all, when you read the book, you will see how strong that mummy feels about her son. But I must admit, when I was reading the story, I did think, but you did something wrong. You know, it's, it's okay, you won't survive in jail. Who would survive in jail? I don't think I'd survive in jail, but if I did something wrong, clearly that's where I'm going to end up. Okay, so I wondered one thing, because... That particular character was a very strong one for me. Um, did you ever think of telling the point of view, the story from the boy's point of view? Did you have a play with it and then come back? No, I, I went stuck to my format. I had a really strong structure before I started writing it. I've been thinking about it and talking about it for a couple of years. And by the time I sat down to write it, I was like, to two mothers and you know if i was if there were suggestions about introducing another character it's like no it's two mothers it's the mother's story so i really was very determined to tell the mother's story and it's a story about choices and i know it's it starts with a very tragic incident but there's also lots of lightness and family dynamics and all of those things that make life funny um they're also included in the story so it's not just a really bleak, tragic story from, from start to finish. It does have some well, Julie, there's a lot of love in the story. The mothers do what they do because of their love for their son. So I actually wanted to touch on that a little bit. There are two very different mothers, as you mentioned, in one bunch. So we have Evie and Yasmin, and they're both very well portrayed. I mean, you nailed it. Obviously, you have some wonderful girlfriends because understanding how women think and act, it really comes across so well in the story. So what I wanted to ask was, how do you go about, as an author, creating such strong characters? Do you have a process or is it just luck that this happens? I think um, say it's <laughs> hours of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hours of editing, actually. Okay. So the characters that I started out with, I think, were quite different to the ones I ended up with. But, yes, I have stolen lots and lots of anecdotes and little tiny elements from everyone I know and the characters in the book are very flawed whereas you guys are amazing <laughs> and, and that if you recognize anyone in the book or you think oh did I do that did you still? no that's not you if it's nasty it's not you if it's good then it was you so I want you to know you guys are amazing you're amazing parents and you would never do anything that happens in this oh. so and neither would I, I certainly would not. Oh, we're actually getting to that but before we get to whether you would or you wouldn't um Yasmin in particular is quite interesting to me and so there was one part where Yasmin, one of the mums, feels a lot of guilt towards what she should and shouldn't have done for her son. And I wondered, I think we all understand that mother guilt and father guilt as well. We should have gone earlier and picked the kids up and then they wouldn't have got bullied. Or we should have packed a better lunch for them so they didn't get, you know, a headache after school. Whatever the problem is, parenthood is just full of guilt. Would you agree? Yeah. I think so. And I wondered about, um, Julie, how you captured that. Was it something that you felt a lot of, or you just, whatever you boys so, want to do, you just get ahead and do it? Talk us through mother guilt in particular. Mother guilt is a very, very strong thing, isn't it? I, you, you know, I'm. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I, I, I don't know. Is there a mother out there or anywhere who doesn't feel guilty about something they've done or something they didn't do? You know, I should have been more patient. I should have been more thoughtful. And it's interesting now that I've moved because my kids are, are young adults now and, you know, pretty much I don't have to supervise everything or anything really. Um, I've now moved on to daughter guilt. I wish I'd done that. I wish I, and then my mother the other day, and I hope I don't cry when I say, say this, but I signed, um, I signed a book for my mother and she said, I wish I'd loved you more. I should have loved you more. Did you love me more? Oh, I, I said so But yeah, so mother, my mother's 80, so I don't think we're going to get rid of mother guilt anytime soon. <laughs> so, I love that it's changed. From mother to daughter, and then back to friend goes the other way. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing that I've noticed when Yasmin is talking about her art, so she's the creative person in the story, and she's an artist rather than a author. And um, she told us a lot about um, feeling like she's not a very good artist. And, and in the industry, we call that imposter syndrome, where you feel like one day someone's going to say, would you just stop writing, okay? <laughs> no one likes your stories. <laughs> <laughs> just and and <laughs> do you feel that at all, Julie? Or, or do you just push that aside? Or do your friends for you? Like, what does she say in books? Like, does she say, I just shouldn't do this? How many times, have anyone here ever heard Julie say, I really don't think I should be an author. No, no, no. <laughs> she never, she I doesn't have it. No, I probably suffer from overconfidence. So. <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't suffer from overconfidence. I, uh, I probably suffer from resilience because I do bounce no, back. Suffer. No, fantastic. but well, yeah, it's very handy as an author to be resilient. But the creative industries for people who are out there who are in the creative industry, as you will absolutely know this, it's a roller coaster. So some days it's like this, like tonight, it's amazing and it's exciting and you feel like you've achieved something great, but tomorrow I will walk into a bookshop and if my books aren't front and centre, I'll, oh, you know, <laughs> end of the world. This is all over. This is the last book I ever write. So, you know, Sorry, I all move them. No, just move them. Uh, yes, absolutely. So I have done a little bit of rearranging just quietly in some stores so I can get away with it. I do have some spies out there who are doing some not very special. You could move that to a top shelf if you like. So yeah, it's good to have a support network and marketing team who are all on your side, but you do need people to remind you to enjoy the moments and celebrate every success even if it's a tiny success you have to celebrate it <laughs> other authors out there who know you have to and creative people who who know you have to really celebrate those successes every time there's a success and if someone says that's amazing you have to go yeah thank you that was instead of going oh well it's probably been a lot better and you know I really could have done this and that because you know it could go low <laughs> next week before it goes high again. So yes, it is a, a roller coaster and yes, imposter syndrome, yes. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to wonder whether you've ever had this happen to you. So I was in an event called Reader's Cup today where all the children read five books and then they get asked questions. And I had a child come up today to me to say, well, I didn't read your book because it didn't look very good, but I read this one. Could you sign this one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have that to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I signed it. <laughs> I have seen people go, I'm not saying that that's my, not my book, but I'm pretty sure I've signed other people's books yes. as well. So. I do tell them, you know, I'm not the author, and they seem quite pleased about that. <laughs> a signature is a signature. All people's scraps of paper. I didn't buy your book, but can you sign my scrap of paper? Sure. Because you can see a queue a mile long for Samantha Wheeler and I've got three kids. So I'm like, oh, I don't care what I'm signing. I'm signing. Look at me, signing. So I think she's making things up now. Okay, so we've talked about that. We've talked about that imposter syndrome. So here's the video. If you scratch someone's car in the car park and no one was looking, would you fess up? Do you need a little note? Would you just drive away? 
I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to respond. No, I would definitely, if should I scratch, I, yeah, I should ask the audience. But I, before we do that, I, I'm going to share a story about when we went to the Vietnamese restaurant next door with my book club. And shop, shop chain? No, no, this, this one just right here. There's another, what's that called? I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, great little Vietnamese restaurant. I will be checking there. <laughs> And one of the girls was running late. She parked just off the street and she came back and said, I think I nudged. I'm, she was driving a massive four wheel drive. I think I have nudged the car behind me with the tow bar. We're like, oh, yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> you know? And she's like, I'm going back. I'm going back and I'm going to leave a note. And so I went back with her and we investigated, and there's a couple of scratches on the car, and it's like, it could be, it could have been her, it, yeah, or maybe it wasn't, but she left a note, she did the right thing. And the girl billed her for every scratch on her car, <laughs> which is actually, to, that's actually, uh, I've used that in, in the book. That's the one I in the book. So, so that was a little lesson for me. Yeah, it's no, like, no. Think, think twice. <laughs> you know, I think if you have obviously banged into someone, yes, but I think if it's, did I do them or I didn't? You know, it's you might get built for every scratch on someone's car. Yeah, okay, I won't do that. <laughs> so, what about anyone in the audience? Have any of you been through the self serve at Millie's and Coles? Has anyone ever forgotten to pay for their Walker shortbread down the bottom of the street? Hands up if you've ever forgotten. And just, just kept walking and okay. just kept and going. Did, you don't have to admit to it, but did, did you ever just keep going? Is there a mixture well, of people? Who's gone back in and paid for the thing? But it, but <laughs> it's, but it's <laughs> different. But it's different at Woolies versus the corner store. The corner store, right? Where really? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Where yeah. you've got a personal connection. You know, it's coming out of someone's you know, wage or rather than Mr. Woolies, a lot of money. <laughs> so <laughs> if you it's not a shot that you book from Avid Reader, where do we sit with that one? <laughs> that you definitely <laughs> come back. You definitely come back. If you accidentally shot with the book from Kmart, then you have to get them. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say what I would do. I'm just saying what you would do. <laughs> but I think this is the great thing about your book, Julie. I think it's so divisive. I think a lot of people will enjoy this with book club, book club. Would you agree with me? I think people's attitude to protecting their son is very different to a scratch on the car or walk a short bread of woolies. And so I put myself in that dilemma and the two girls and I wondered, and a husband, of course, and I, I wondered if he came home. <laughs> strange things to all of us and if someone makes a mistake that will mark them for the rest of their lives I wondered whose camp I would be in protect my child or own up and I think this is the important thing that you bring to the table with this story you don't really tell us in a didactic way what we should do you let us decide and I think that is a real um talent that you have with this story and I don't know whether that was natural or whether the editors did it or what happened but you nailed it Julie you really did because I came away really thinking of the dilemma myself and I think it is a book that will really stay with people after they've finished reading it and the other thing that I think that the discussion will be about is the punishment thing and I think it's the same with Indigenous people who are repeatedly incarcerated the punishment doesn't always match the crime but on the other hand, the person, the victim, their life's going to change forever. And I wonder how you how you toyed with that when you were writing the story about the, the, the sentence. Of the, did you have to go and talk to, well, you obviously got a lawyer friend. What did you find out about the punishments and the sentences for these all these valley incidents that you talked about? Yeah, well, to begin with, I when I started thinking about the story, I thought about the mother seeking revenge and that's really was the strong kind of plot that I wanted to follow. And then I was started hearing stories about 
boys in our community who were jailed for assault. Yeah. So kids, 18 year olds, straight out of school, from good homes, they look, you know, were, had their futures ahead of them, um, should have been in uni, but they were going to jail for, for a very, very catastrophic mistake. And so there was someone in Brisbane who was jailed for eight months, and then a friend of mine in England was telling me about a friend of hers and her son had got into a fight outside a bar, punched someone unconscious, He's left with a head injury, not a brain injury, but a head injury. And he fled the scene. His parents marched him back to the police station and he was jailed for 18 months. And that's a catastrophic decision and violence is never okay. But I started thinking about the story from the other mother's point of view, which I hadn't in the beginning. And then once I got into it, that's, that's the story I wanted to tell. I wanted just to tell the two sides of the coin. And I guess being a journalist, that made sense to me to see the story from both sides and to get to, to kind of report. It was almost like a journalistic exercise writing this book anyway because I interviewed or sort of talked to so many people. So I felt like I really wanted to see the story from both sides. And as I was writing it, I was really shifting my sympathy between the two mothers and you know they're both extremely flawed and they both make really bad decisions and their kids have made catastrophic well one in particular has made a catastrophic decision but um i've forgotten the second half of the question but, um, <laughs> no, i was talking about jail sentences oh, and the sentences yeah no i did yeah yeah no i did a lot of research about basically assault and it's you know it, it just felt tragic the whole thing just felt tragic you know i didn't you know i didn't feel like oh that shouldn't happen and this should happen and i don't have answers at all but i just felt an overwhelming sense that 18 year olds going to jail for 18 months or five years or 10 years if they kill someone and it's just so tragic for the victim, their family, but also for the perpetrator and their family. It's just like, there are no winners in this situation. It is just so horrific. And it was just, it was very, yeah, it was quite difficult researching it. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing when you read the book is you sway between each mother's point of view. You do. And so you said you felt like that when you were writing it. I certainly felt like that when I was reading it. I've got a few questions here, but I'm going to skip a couple because I'd really love to hear you read a bit of the book. Yeah. And we're going to take some questions from the audience. But one of the questions that you said people have been asking you, and I would like you to explain to the audience perhaps, is was it a conscious decision to leave COVID out of the story? <laughs> because, you know, it was written probably in today. Well, and, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote it during COVID and like many people wrote, many people who wrote their novel, their debut novel during COVID, apparently that was the thing. Everyone wrote their debut novel. Um, some people wrote COVID in and I, and I left COVID out and it was actually the publisher who, as I said, do I include COVID? <laughs> No, no one wants to hear about COVID. And I just read a book by Jodie Bacot, <laughs> who include, you know, it's, it features COVID. And I have to say, it was quite difficult to read because it's like, uh, just spent two years reading about nothing else. So I'd yeah. really like to move. I know we haven't moved on, and there's a lot of people who couldn't make it because of COVID. So we definitely haven't moved on, but I felt like a book doesn't need to be that realistic. I think too, we also read to escape, and I don't know if I can hear that word again on the screen. So, like you, I don't think I'd like to read it in the story. So, well done you for leaving it out. It also complicates the plot, I think, because although we live with it, suddenly it becomes the third or fourth character in the story. Yeah, so, the masks and how yeah. does that work? And you're not going to be in the valley in the first place, and not the nightclub. So, and I, because I like, come up with the idea before COVID, and then all the nightclubs shut down, it's like, hmm. I don't know how long this is going to go on if this is ever going to be relevant again, but yeah, it is. It's relevant again. 
definitely. Well, you talked about Jody Co, which I didn't know that's how you pronounce it. So oh, thanks, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I see this as a book that many people would compare to Jody's work because we do have such a strong point of view from two very strong characters. And Jody does the turnabout. Um, uh, chapters and I and I said to to Julie earlier this evening is that a comparison that you embrace or is it a comparison that you'd rather not have I think Jodie's done so incredibly well she can be quite a divisive author people love her or hate her and I just thought gosh if anyone compared me to anyone that famous I think I'd be pretty chuffed well, Julie, I am. Yes, 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 yes. Very flashed, very yes. flashed. Yes. It was my publisher who compared me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> She'll that's be inviting right. you over in her private jets. <laughs> She's going to be very, <laughs> very intimidated by the quality of my work. Well, I think it's about time we yeah. heard some of this amazing story. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think we should ask Julie yeah. to read a special part of it? Well, I'll just read a tiny bit from the beginning. And I think it goes to the guilt question because the story opens in steamboat and yasmin the protagonist is in the hot tub <laughs> when her phone starts to ring so is that your phone cat asked just try to ignore it it'll be one of the boys they're probably looking for the oven cat laughed i had a text from toby about the washing machine Mum, I really think it shut itself. <laughs> Care factor zero, Yasmin said, sinking a little deeper. We're on holidays, not staff from the domestic support desk. She had a son at university and two at high school, plus a perfectly competent husband. Surely they could fend for themselves for a week. It wasn't like she travelled for work or flitted around the world on endless self-discovery journeys like some people she knew. She rarely went anywhere without them. Her last solo trip had been over a year ago. A spa weekend with friends ended abruptly at a highway service station in the toilets, thanks to a dubious turkey sandwich. She'd been off duty for less than a day. As for the ski trip, it was a last minute thing, a favor to catch because her sister had been forced to cancel. Admittedly, skiing in Colorado wasn't an arduous favor, but still, she'd had jet lag to contend with and a very surly flight attendant on the way over. Her phone buzzed again. This time, her shoulders started to tense as it dawned on her. It was late morning in Steamboat, but it was the middle of the night in Australia. She clambered out of the pool, dried her hands on a toweling robe, unwrapped the phone. James, five missed calls. She stared at the screen, the mineral salt suddenly abandoning her muscles and the pain in her hip flaring. Her husband wasn't calling about an appliance. So, that's no, can we <laughs> So that's, that's Yasmin, and as you can see, she's going to feel rather guilty when she's been sitting in a hot tub in Steamboat when things have been going on back home in Australia. So that's where her guilt starts, but that's not the end of her guilt. I know you want to do some thank yous, I but do. before you do that, um, the Queensland Writer Centre runs an adaptive program, and you talked about seeing this on the screen when you first wrote it. Now you've come full circle. Tell us just quickly what that meant. What was the adaptable program? Okay, so the Queensland Writer Centre runs a program where they choose 20 books and 20 writers um, and have a chance to pitch your work to screen producers at the Gold Coast Film Festival. So and you get chosen amongst millions of people. And yes, so I went to Gold Coast Film Festival this year um, with 19 hot authors. And it was interesting actually because they're a complete range of books and different stories and then pitched my story to a bunch of screen producers and it's just kind of a five minute speed dating kind of thing and everyone gets super excited and then you never hear from them again but that's okay you know you win yes it's a win you know we celebrate the wins and, Sham and Samantha and I um, had another win a few years ago when we were invited to the Adaptable Festival to pitch and we drank champagne on the basis of all of the excitement that happened but you know we're still waiting we're still waiting for the call from the producers <laughs> so you, just never know. you, you know, never know happen. you never know just back yourself that's that's really what you have to do when you're creative you have to back yourself 
really firmly because you have to head for the free champagne. <laughs> 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 time. Well, Julie, I'll invite you now to say any thank yous that you want. But before you do, hasn't she done an amazing job? Yeah. 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 It's easier for me to talk to you than it is for Julie. It's, it's scary putting yourself on the page. So much of us goes into that writing. And I don't think Julie showed an iota of it, but I find it really nerve-wracking to read to my peers and my friends. So she's done an amazing job, and it's a beautiful story. Christmas isn't far away. So <laughs> buy a <laughs> stock up. Okay. Oh, and I did, sorry, yes. I will take the questions in a second, but go ahead and, and do your thank yous, Julie. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and everyone on Zoom, my publisher, a firm, avid reader, my amazing book clubs, my amazing <laughs> mothers of boys around the place and mothers of girls. I also love you and think you're amazing. My sons and my husband who are big supporters and thank you for all of your crazy use adventures that may or may not have happened that I may or may not have used in my story. Thank you for that. Always an inspiration, but I'm also very proud of you boys. Um, thank you to my medical friends who were so, so amazing and generous with their time. Dr. Campbell, I can't see you, but I'm talking about you, as well as Karen and Caroline and I think my other medical friends that couldn't make it tonight, but I know there's lots of you out there. COVID. <laughs> um, because this story needed a lot of research. I didn't know anything about brain injuries. Um, my boys had both had concussions, but, you know, apart from that, I needed a lot of help. Oh, and Aideen, you also helped with some medical stuff. Thank you. So I needed a lot of help with the, the brain injury stuff. And so I went to Dr. Campbell and sat down for an hour and he told me everything there was to know about brain surgery. So it was true. So I was like writing notes and I filled up a full cap book full of notes and then I had to go to Karen and go. So can you help me just like up all this and just tell me the story <laughs> so I can just find a thread because I don't need to know everything. I just need to know one thing because I won't understand. And then I realized I didn't need to be an expert because the mother is not an expert. She's, um, she just, she was confused. And I actually took that into the story, that confusion about a doctor telling you what's going on and really having no idea what they're saying and thinking, that you understand and thinking about your questions as soon as you get home. So, and to all of my, and thank you to all of my friends for sharing their mothering stories. And even though you didn't know you were sharing, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyway. Um, yes, Avid Reader did a great job. Thank you very much for being very, very organized and putting on a great event tonight. It's been really good. And, so we're going to questions now, and I know there'll be a couple of people with questions. So yes, only ask really hard ones. <laughs> she's way too good. She doesn't get flustered. She's calm. She's resilient. Let's see what we can do, shall we? So, oh no! I don't want that one or not? Okay, okay. it's a question about the very person. John, we don't know who he is. Could be anyone. Related to the group. <laughs> is it true that Dr. Campbell is playing himself in the story, Julie? Over to you. <laughs> we, we are already starting to quietly um, cast characters for the book. And Dr. Campbell has thrown in a few suggestions for the Dr. Campbell figure in that character in the story and I can't say who it is but oh, tell us, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> he may he may play, play himself Marie I know you had a question okay <laughs> and we have to repeat it because of the zoom people they can't oh yes okay, okay. okay. that's yeah. why we're repeating me like that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to I just want to commend Julie and Martin about a very complex and confronting moments of writing it's a really tough thing for all of us my question centers around structure. So I really enjoyed the structure of the, of the novel because you had alternating characters. Those alternating characters allowed me to understand the journey, but I thought 
and, I, and it was really clever how you described them. But I just want to know how you were able to keep it balanced. Because that would have been so challenging. You may have had a bias towards one mm -hmm. character or another. It would be really interesting to understand. Just to rephrase yeah, the question. Yeah. So we've got an audience member for those of you on Zoom who's been very impressed by the way that Julie's handled the, the two point of views from chapter to chapter. And her question is wondering how you kept that even. If you had a bit of a bias at times, how did you make sure you kept that even? I kept it, I, sorry, I kept it even by just being in their heads, you know, just by being them. Um, and I think that's what you always do as a writer. And if you can't jump inside their head, then you probably don't know your character well enough. But if you do know your character well enough, then you will just write as if they're on the, you know, they're telling their story, they're telling their side of the story almost. So then you feel like you can't, you're just feeling like, you know, I didn't feel like I was more one than the other. I felt equally that I was them when I was in that character. I was definitely with them going going through their struggle, going through their journey. And um, so I don't think it, I didn't find it more difficult to write to write one than the other. Like that. But, um, both both challenging, but both yeah, yeah. equally. Well said. And I think that uh, reflects how well you um, develop the characters probably in your head before you started writing. Um, having that knowledge of who you are and you're far away, which is why when someone knocks on the door, you really have the world. So when you're in Evie's world, you fully believe in Evie. Um, when you're asking the world, you fully believe in her. Now, we have a question on the Zoom, but unfortunately, we've read your two minutes. Come on away. <laughs> Lucky we have Jackie here to sort us out. So from Zoom, we have a question for you, Julie. The author spoke about one punch being the story she thought she had to write. Now she's written it. Has it changed her perspective? Or the was she perceived? Or I think it means, or what she perceives as the moral and physical dangers that must still exist. After writing it, um, yeah, you those stories it about one punch, did it change, uh, like one punch is in the valley? Has this story changed your point of view? Yeah, it gave me a clearer idea, I think, of acts of perpetrators, I guess, which I hadn't really considered before. Um, I think if I felt the same about being a mother of a victim or being a parent of a victim. Um, but I think I went into the story thinking that people who assaulted other people anywhere were thugs and they were covered in tattoos and you know, I, I think I had a very stereotyped view of what a perpetrator looked like but I think after doing a lot of research and thinking about the story from someone else's point of view I had a different different idea that it could be it could be someone with you yeah it could be someone like that could be someone in a queue later when there's only one <laughs> copy <laughs> <Anybody. Sorry. laughs> Do we have any other questions for Julie? Oh, she's here. Yes, we have one of the other yes. So, yeah, so the question was, did I speak to mothers of perpetrators to get the other side of the coin? I didn't go personal because, and I didn't really want to go too personally on the other side either because I didn't want it to be someone's story and then to feel like I was exploiting someone's tragedy. And I think that's, that's a really fine line to run because you want to know their stories and everything, but thank goodness for the internet because we can suck down all of the, you know, there's so many blogs and there is so much information that we can gather without actually talking to people. And, and it, and, and sure, talking to people is absolutely um, so valuable. But I also 
didn't want to get to the end of the story and someone to say, what happened to my story? That's not what happened. That is not realistic. That, that would never happen. You know, I don't know anyone this would happen. And I actually had a bit of a debate with my publisher at the end of um, when I when I submitted the story and she's like, love the story, love the voices, but the ending has to change. And I will leave it to you to decide if I did the right thing, taking her advice and changing the ending. Um, but I think from a journalist's point of view, I had an idea of the way I thought it should end um, and she had a different idea. And because she's a publisher and basically she said, it's totally up to you, but... She's, yeah, I trusted, I trusted her. I trusted her because she's a publisher of many successful books. And, you know, I, this was my first book for adults. And, and I do often fall into the trap of like, this is what would really happen. And, you know, even when I was writing books for the kids, I'd be, you know, something very realistic and they go, yeah, mom, but that's really boring. So, you know, <laughs> could we have a crocodile in there? Could we have anyone being shot at this point? So, you know, it was always like bump it up a bit. Yes, no, I did it. I didn't, but I did lots of research and I didn't want to disappoint someone, but I'd taken their story and then kind of misappropriated it, I guess. Yeah. Okay, we're moving to the all we have the plan. Do you have plans? Oh, I wanted to ask. This is a great question. Do you have a plan? Look, Jackie's made a huge. <laughs> Do you have a plan for your next book? And will you stay in adult fiction? Well, I do have a plan, and I'm halfway through my second novel for adults. Of course you are. <laughs> because I have a contract for a second book, so with a firm press. And I have a deadline in October this year, which is like really, really close. <laughs> and every month I go, wow, I still haven't really progressed it. I had a fantastic holiday in the Kimberley. And that still hasn't progressed because, you know, every time I go away, I think, yeah, but I'll totally do some work while I'm there. But, you know, I actually never do. Do some work. I always do some work on a flight with great intentions. And then, of course, you know, who's going to work in the Kimberley? It's just so amazing. You just want to explore. So, yes, it will happen. It will happen. I will get down to it. And another story for, for, um, for adults is my next. Yeah, no, I, I'm done with kids for the time being. But, yeah, in, really enjoying writing for adults. And is it going to be similar, like uh, point of view turnabout sort of thing? Yeah, there, there'll be more characters in this one, but another gripping suburban drama. So that's <laughs> All happening in the suburbs. Like, why wouldn't I? Because I can just steal stories from you guys. Why would I write historical fiction? I had to work so hard. Margaret. I just wanted to ask about this theory that writers sit on a story for 20 years and they've got all the great ideas and the and every other book afterwards is kind of a plan of well, I have come up with something fresh and reasonably new. The idea was certainly fresh and new, but as I'm writing it, I find myself trotting down the same, almost the same story and little scenes that I had in my last book. It's like, feels really familiar. Okay, I'm going to have to change this one up. So it is really difficult. It's really difficult because I did put... 20 something years of parenting into one punch and stolen all your stories already. And so I'm actually working on stealing some dad stories for the second month. I actually am. That's what that's that's my plan for the second book. So there's some key, key dads. It's not a story about parenting, but it's there's there's sort of more dad involvement in the next one. Maybe you have to join something. Maybe another book club. Well, <laughs> 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 She's such a fresh idea. Right. 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 A men's book, a dad's book club. So if you guys set up a book club, I would definitely join it. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to start. This is going to be your first book for the dad's book club. So I can recommend it. Hey, and just one last thing before we finish, because we're probably, uh, I think they're running. Oh, we're doing all right. Okay. So just one thing, and then we'll go back to questions. If you like the book, 
rate it on Goodreads and Abbott and wherever, write a little review, give it five stars, nothing less than that. If you don't like it, keep it to yourself. <laughs> Don't you walk away, just leave it at a bus stop, someone will enjoy it. And tell tell the world, tell your friends. Super important. Any more questions? Does she tell you what books you have to read and whether you like them or not? There's a cue, there's a cue for both of them, actually. Well, if we don't have any more questions, will we just put our hands together one more time and, and let's declare one time. for being a really awesome conversation partner and a great friend and a great writer. It's a very talented kids writer. So thank you. Oh, and I would like to say thank you to a couple of people on Zoom. And one would be Tina Marie Clark, who runs the CYA conference. And that's where I met my publisher, pitched the story to her at a, an assessment session. This is she, and Tina said, this, just be aware, everyone, this is an assessment session. It's so a pitch session. <laughs> so, yeah. always back yourself. <laughs> Thank you. But I think what we need to do is let the lady of the moment sneak through to the signing table where we can Ooh. all glamour around her <laughs> and make her feel very, very famous. Do you agree? <laughs> yes. yes. All right, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you get the same as well. Yes, like 